Imagine yourself flying high at an altitude of 40 kilometers above the hamlet of Basholi in Himachal Pradesh and looking north. This is what you will see. The great western Himalaya is seen emerging from the lower right and surging forward in a northwesterly direction. The high passes of Potla, Omasila and then the great Nunkun peaks are seen. Beyond, the range dips into the Zojila defile to rise in a final mighty thrust towards the dizzy heights of Nanga Parbat, the westernmost extremity of the Great Himalaya. Bounded to the west and south by the Pir Panjals, the valley is drained by the Jhelum and its tributaries. The Sindh, coming from the Zojila and the Lidder, debouching from the upper Pehelgam region. Geologists opine that the Vale of Kashmir was once a large lake called the Kareva. The Kareva was formed when the Jhelum was blocked by the rising Pir Panjals in one of the periodic phases of Himalayan uplift. The river finally escaped its encirclement by gouging a deep cut across the Pir Panjal at Uri. And when the waters of the Kareva drained here from what is termed the Jhelum Gap, the Valley of Kashmir came into being. Mankind has been around in the Kashmir Valley for a long, long time. But the early history of Kashmir is lost in the mists of legend. The valley's name is often attributed to the sage Kashyap, being a corruption of the original Kashyap Mar. Kashmiri history becomes clearer after the advent of the Mauryan Empire under Ashoka. During this period, Buddhism spread in Kashmir, taking firm root by the time of the Kushan Empire in the 1st century AD. From here, Buddhism spread to Ladakh, Tibet, Central Asia and beyond. The clearly visible Dardic influences in this Maitrey Buddha statue at the village of Mulbek in Ladakh dated back to before the advent of Islam in the Kashmir Valley. Buddhist belief has it that the Maitrey Buddha is the fifth in a series of a thousand Buddhas that will visit the world. Estimates of its age range between the 1st century BC to the 5th century AD. Islam came to the valley in the 14th century through the combined influence of Sayyid preachers and the Muslim rule established in the middle of that century. By the end of the century, barring small sections of the Hindu orthodoxy, the valley was almost totally Muslim. Buddhism now retreated behind the Himalaya. The modern history of Kashmir is centered around the Dogra dynasty. Maharaja Gulab Singh got the Jagir of Jammu from Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1820 and two years later became the full-fledged ruler of Jammu. In March 1846, the aftermath of the Anglo-Sikh War saw Maharaja Gulab Singh gain complete control over modern India's largest princely state, Jammu and Kashmir 
which included Ladakh and Baltistan. A number of smaller rulers still functioned under the aegis of the Maharaja, and the best known of these is Basholi, famous for its school of miniature paintings. And one of the best collections of these paintings is housed in a museum here at the Amar Mehal Palace in Jammu. These paintings tell the story of Nala and Damayanti in exquisite detail and make extensive use of gold leaf, which remains just as bright today. We'll have a more extensive look at these little delights in today's Culture Watch. This city of Jammu was founded in the 9th century by Raja Jambu Lochan, from whom the city gets its name. Mubarak Mandi, this complex of palaces, halls of audience, or the Darbar, dates back, going by the pastiche of architectural styles, to the Victorian era. Nowadays, it is occupied by government offices. It is dilapidated, crumbling, and slowly going to seed. The Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage has put forward a plan to relocate the offices and possibly convert the site to a heritage hotel. Jammu itself is known as the city of temples. The largest Shiv temple in northern India, the Ranbireshwar and the Raghunathji are two of the prime attractions. The Raghunathji was built by Maharaja Ranbir Singh, son of the founder ruler of Jammu and Kashmir. The oldest structures here date back to 150 years or so. One of the world's most popular pilgrimage sites also lies in the Jammu region. Nearly two and a half million pilgrims come from all over the country every year for a darshan of Mata Vaishnu Devi.
Kashmiri social dynamics are more akin to plains people than to other Himalayan hill peoples. Complex and highly stratified, despite the age-old conversion to Islam, Kashmiri society is layered by caste, considerations that generally come to play during marriages, etc. Surprisingly, Kashmiri society never really had a warrior or trading class. Though Taurus times saw all classes take to trading like a duck to water. The lakes and waterways of Kashmir had a big effect on shaping the people, leading to the growth of a significant boat community whose unusual lifestyle has been molded by their surroundings. Living their lives on the water, they are a truly unique Himalayan community. The fascination of tourists with houseboats led to the emergence of entrepreneurs within this community who converted their houseboats into luxurious floating hotels. Another typical Kashmiri is the Bakarwal, semi-nomadic goat herders. The meadows of the upper Lidar and the Suru Valley beyond are their favorite stamping grounds. Kashmir through the ages has been known for the quality of its crafts. The Kashmiri weaver is synonymous with perfection and artistry. Besides their traditional crafts and agriculture, the other major factor in the Kashmiri economy was tourism. Seven years of civil strife saw the crippling of this sector and consequent impoverishment of thousands of small businessmen and craftspeople. Changed times are on the anvil though and tourists are already trickling back in. This is Srinagar's Lal Chowk, barometer of the people's mood, and once again starting to look the way it did during the halcyon days of the 70s and 80s. Hopefully, a new era of peace and prosperity has again dawned on this heavenly valley. Kashmir's long and multifaceted history is reflected in its craft traditions. From the Mauryan and Kushan period, 
through a period of Tibetan influence before finally setting its sights on the west towards Mecca. Kashmir received the most highly developed influences of Hindu, Buddhist and Islamic cultures. Skilled workers from Central Asia and Iran provided a remarkable cross-fertilization. Carpet weaving, finely painted paper mache, paper making, weaving of shawls of pashmina and other fine wools, metalwork and jewelry all flourished in the succeeding centuries. Weaving of both carpets and the famed Kashmir shawl are traditions and techniques handed down over the generations by the master weavers of Persia. The techniques, the talim or the instruction sheet and the karkhanas remain as they must have been for centuries. The weavers chant the talim while working. Wages are paid by the thousand knots. And of course, the more knots per square inch, the finer the ultimate result. The patterns are reproductions and adaptations of Persian, Turkish and Turkman motifs and designs. Trained from an early age, when fingers are nimble, Many master weavers are only in their early 30s. Showrooms adjoining the karkhanas are stacked high with the finished product. Kashmiri work on wood is no less famous. Master craftsmen create symphonies out of walnut wood. But the pride of place is held by the famous Kashmir shawl. Kashmir wool is pashmina, a soft wool, found on the underbelly of the pashmina goat. Jammu has always existed under Kashmir's shadow, but culturally, the Dogras have a rich lineage. This temple at Burj, some 24 kilometers outside the city of Jammu, dates four to 600 years. The octagonal structure is lined with frescoes. The very clearly visible Rajput form is uh, intermingled with influences from the Himalayas. For example, there's one fresco with Iris gamaudensis, a Himalayan flower species, which uh, exists along with palm trees. Yet another fresco shows a very Dante's Inferno-like uh, uh, tortures of the damned uh, scene, whereas another one shows the 24 avatars of Hinduism, yet others show the Mahabharat, and so on.
The 40-odd Basholi miniatures housed in the Amar Mahal Museum constitute one of the finest collections of hill miniatures in the world. These detail the epic love saga of Nala and Damayanti and are priceless remnants of the artistic heritage of the Hindu Himalaya. Each frame is a tapestry of love, betrayal and passion, liberally embellished with gold and exquisitely detailed. Another wing of the palace houses a collection of the early works of contemporary Indian artists like M F Hussain, Sobha Singh, Sarbjit Singh, Krishan Khanna and others. The Pir Panjal range runs in an arc shape along the southern periphery of the Kashmir Valley, forming the jagged southern wall of the ancient lake basin of Kashmir. The range is not particularly high here and is better known for its forested slopes and grassy alps, such as Gulmarg. The range, however, 
is high enough to provide an effective barrier to the southwest monsoon. Precipitation in the Kashmir Valley is brought about by local climatic cycles governed by its numerous lakes and marshes. The main range itself similarly shields the valley from the trans-Himalayan climate. Most of the lakes of Kashmir are remnants of ancient oxbows created by the river Jhelum as it meanders across the valley floor and the present lakes are shrunken remnants of their past selves. The Dal Lake, for example, has shrunk in the past 50 years to half its size from 22 to 11 square kilometers. In the intervening years, the lake has changed in other fashions too. The classic example of environmental degradation in a Himalayan lake ecosystem today is the Dal Lake in Srinagar. The process known as eutrophication has set in. Eutrophication results when the lake waters become artificially enriched with nutrients, causing abnormal plant growth. Runoff of chemical fertilizers from the vast drainage basin around the lake sewage and other oxygen demanding wastes are all factors that combine to place the lake's internal life processes under severe stress. The Himalayas are often not as strong as they look for, as they say, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Large hydroelectric projects in the Himalayas that entail large-scale earth moving and the creation of large reservoirs, besides being ecologically devastating, also harbor the potential for creating tectonic trouble. In this respect, run-of-the-river schemes are not only more eco-friendly, but involve no large-scale disruption of the strata. Kashmir, incidentally, is a pioneer in run-of-the-river schemes. In 1904, the Maharaja of Mysore as a gift to the people of Kashmir, built a powerhouse, the state's first, at Mahura, beyond Baramula. This ancient powerhouse is still operational, and a sight to see is its miles-long water channel made of cedar wood. After spinning the turbine blades, the water is back in the river, none the worse for its journey.